Hello everyone, this is Colin once again. I'm making this video because recently I bought a book entitled Memories of Muhammad, a biography, Why the Prophet Matters. And it's written by Omid Safi, who's a PhD, and he's a professor of, of Islamic studies in, at North Carolina Whitechapel Hill, or excuse me, Chapel Hill, excuse me, not Whitechapel. Chapel Hill, excuse me. Uh, where it's the same university that um, the biblical scholar Bar Ehrman also teaches. And uh, uh, Dr. Omid Safi has done an amazing biography on the Prophet, and uh, some uh, explanation should be given about why he chose the title of his book, Memories of Muhammad. Uh, he did this because while the bi his biography of the Prophet does deal in a linear fashion with the Prophet's life, Throughout it, he is careful to examine how different Muslims at different periods in Islamic history have remembered the Prophet, and so hence the title "Memories of Muhammad." And so it's a fresh biography; it's the newest biography, and um, I think it's, it's he did a very good job. But the thing is, that I usually will read the introduction to a book, as everyone should. But I read the introduction to this book and just found it amazing. Uh, his message is clear and concise. And he's commenting on um, the issues that people have with the Prophet, uh, non-Muslims have with the Prophet, in today's society. And I feel that his introduction alone was worth the buying of the book. Um, needless to say, the rest of it is, is, is excellent. <clears throat> and so what I'm going to do in this video is just read you the introduction. It's going to be in a couple parts. Uh, this is part one, as you can see from the title. And uh, yeah, so I'm just going to be reading from the introduction. And if you find the introduction interesting, uh, go out and purchase the book or check it out from your local library um, because it's really worth uh, uh, a read. So the, his introduction is entitled, The Quote-Unquote Muhammad Problem. A lot of people are having a Muhammad problem these days. It's nothing new. People have been attacking Muhammad for 1,300 years some because of their religious beliefs and others because of their political convictions. He was attacked by his own family during his lifetime for his progressive views. In medieval times, he was attacked by authors like Dante and Martin Luther. And more recently, we have all read the headlines about the infamous Danish cartoon controversies in which a Danish newspaper, in response to terrorist acts done in the name of Islam, published editorial cartoons depicting the Islamic prophet in ways considered by many blasphemous and Islamophobic. Before we can deal with how Muslims themselves have come to remember, revere, and contest the memory of Muhammad, we must deal with those many outside attacks which are important not only for what they reveal about non-Muslims' abilities to understand the significance of one of the leading figures in human history, but also because Muslims today are exceedingly concerned, even defensive, about what others say regarding their prophet. In short, what is said about Muhammad affects all of us, regardless of our faith. It has become commonplace to acknowledge that we live in an interconnected world. Yet it is not just goods, the clothes on our backs, oil, cars, and people, immigrants, refugees, and ideas, human rights, democracy, that are now that now flow freely across the world. It is also the religious insights, sensitivities, and prejudices of our fellow human beings that we increasingly come face to face with. This is particularly relevant to the case of Muhammad, probably the least known and most misunderstood of all the founders of the major world world religions. The geopolitical reality of our world means that many Muslim-majority countries, Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan, as well as Palestine slash Israel, because of the ongoing trauma there, dominate international news, and this has resulted in a hitherto unseen interest in Islam among many people. The interest is also most personal for many. In the United States alone, some six million Americans have adopted the Islamic faith, about the same number as there are American Jews or American Orthodox Christians. Perhaps a similar number of Americans now have Muslims as members of their families. One particularly pugnant reminder was the 2009 speech of President Barack Obama in Turkey in which he stated, quote, The United States has been enriched by Muslim Americans. Many other Americans have Muslims in their family or have lived in a Muslim-majority country. I know because I am one of them, end quote. President Obama's personal narrative, received with thunderous applause by Muslims, is a powerful uh, d demonstration of the ways in which the American story and Muslim narratives are irrevocably intertwined now. In the full human community worldwide, there are some 1.3 billion Muslims. 
Whether some of us think of ourselves as Americans first or citizens of one shared planet first, it is simply part of being an educated citizen to have accurate knowledge about the faith of Islam. Muhammad stands at the center of this faith, and there is no way of being familiar with Islam without taking a long, hard, and close look at this figure, which is so beloved by Muslims and yet often vilified by certain non-Muslims. Today, many of the atro atrociously offensive and polemic statements against the Prophet Muhammad come from some Christian leaders who seem persuaded that in tearing down the faith of other human beings, they're building up the faith of their own flock. The former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, Jerry Vines, who is from Jacksonville, Florida, my own birthplace, described the Prophet Muhammad as a, quote, demon-possessed pedophile, end quote. Another Christian critic of the Prophet Muhammad is Franklin Graham, who is the son of the fam famed revivalist Billy Graham, who was handpicked by President George W. Bush to preside over his January 2001 inauguration. The younger Graham has described Islam as a, quote, very evil and wicked religion, end quote. The 2008 Republican nominee for the presidency, John McCain, sought the endorsement of two evangelical Christian leaders, John Hagee and Rod Parsley, and preferred to the latter as his spiritual guide. Hagee, a noted Christian Zionist, has stated that he believes that the threat of Islam surpasses that of Hitler and that Muslims have a Quranic mandate to kill Jews and Christians. Parsley has been even more specific, stating that, quote, Islam is an antichrist religion, and that, quote, Muhammad received revelations from demon spirits, not from the living God, end quote. These have not been isolated episodes. They have been repeated in the most public of settings. Another prominent Christian leader, Pat Robertson, appeared on Fox News on September 18, 2002, to declare that the prophet Muhammad, quote, was an absolute wild-eyed fanatic. He was a robber and a brigand. I mean, this man, Muhammad, was a killer, end quote. Robinson went on to call Islam, quote, a monumental scam, evil and demonic, end quote. Another Christian leader, Jerry Falwell, even used the ultimate post-9-11 code word for the embodiment of all evil in reference to the prophet Muhammad during a 60 Minutes interview, calling the prophet a, quote, unquote, terrorist. One could go on and on here, but these examples probably suffice to make the point. These Christian leaders are not marginal figures. They utter such statements in the most public and high-profile media outlets. If we were dealing with Muslim figures making similarly offensive comments against Christ or labeling all Jews as evil, there would be an international outrage followed by calls for the immediate removal of these figures. Likewise, one could predict the swift outcry of Falwell Robertson had labeled Judaism as demonic or satanic. Yet when statements about Islam or Muhammad are made, the treatment is different. At best, when these Christian leaders call Muhammad a terrorist or the Antichrist, they are seen as exercising their free speech rights rather than as being purveyors of hate speech. At worst, this is perhaps a nagging suspicion among such listeners that these statements contain a kernel of truth. In the beginning, decades of the 21st century, it seems undeniable that at least some Christians and some champions of Western hegemony have a Muhammad problem, and thus an Islam problem. The reason for this problem is not hard to fathom. With the exception of the most bigoted, most Christians today, including the Catholic and Protestant authorities, have rightly come to see that Muslims, Jews, and Christians all worship the same one God, and that all believe in the idea of revelation, redemption, righteous ethics, and accountability. For some Christians, however, the idea of God having reached out to humanity after Christ remains an enigma. Muhammad arraigns for these Christians, though not all of them, a theological challenge in lashing out against Muhammad. They seek to affirm the special relationship they believe God has established with humanity through Christ. Yet these vehemence, that this vehemence has prevented them from being able to see Muhammad in the light of history and faith, and thus understand Islam on its own merit. We keep talking past one another when it comes to Muhammad, and this seems to have resulted in a cognitive dissonance. Try this out the next time you are in a local bookstore. Walk over to the Islam shelf and have a look at all the volumes about the Prophet Muhammad. Even a curiously look indicates that our public discourse about the Prophet Muhammad seems to suffer from a split personality. On the one hand, we see books by pious Muslims and sympathetic non-Muslims proclaiming Muhammad as one of the great teachers of humanity and one of the great divinely sent prophets. On the other hand, we see other titles that promise to provide the reader with quote-unquote the truth about Muhammad, but in fact are marred by a host of inaccuracies, prejudices, and flat-out lies. These titles present Islam either a demonic heresy designed to mock Christianity or an aggressive ideology intent on world domination or destruction. Many of these books are composed by writers who have no expertise in Islam, no familiarity with Islamic history, and no command of languages necessary to acquire such understandings such as Arabic and Persian. 
For that matter, many of them also seem woefully unaware of the problematic aspects of the history of Judaism and Christianity, not to speak of the racism and other ills of Western societies. Yet their lack of qualifications have not prevented these authors from engaging in a great deal of Muhammad bashing and Islam bashing. In a sad display, we are even witnessing the recycling of many height, uh, height, uh, heightened cliches and insults that a century or two ago were directed against Jews, now being directed against Muslims. In particular, in, in some of the ways in which Jews were questioned regarding their loyalties to Europe, as well as to Ju Judaism, many, new view, many now view Muslims with great suspicion and question their loyalties as citizens. Muslims have become the target of a new version of anti-Semitism. One of the most bitter and ironic aspects of this new anti-Semitism is that at least some of these attacks are being led by largely secular Jews, who ultimate concern is the preservation of the current status of the state of Israel, with all of its profoundly problematic policies towards the native Palestinian population there. One small, though influential, example would be that of the largely discredited neoconservative movement, which provided the ideological support for much of the foreign policy of the George W. Bush regime. Much of the neoconservative ideology involved the simultaneously advocacy of a muscular defense of Israel and the demonization of Islam. It boggles the mind that many of the children and grandchildren of Jews, who themselves were the targets of anti-Semitism, could now be directly engaged in spreading a variation of the same poison of anti-Semitism against other members of the human family, especially other children of Abraham. One of the conclusions that one can reach is that often the prejudice against Islam is not the actual disease. It is a symptom of a deeper malice, prejudice and racism. Yet Muhammad bashing is not a new phenomenon. The last decades of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century seen both the continuation of old polemics against Muhammad and the deployment of new ones. 1,000 years ago, the polemics were about violence, sex, and heresy. Today, the polemics are still primarily about violence, sex, and heresy. One cannot help but wonder at how unoriginal these polemics have been over the course of the last thousand years. If the subject matter was not so offensive, perhaps one could joke that in 1,000 years they could have come up with a new polemic. In this volume, we deal extensively with the context of Muhammad's life, and yes, his battles. We address his marital life, which Islamophobes and polemics so frequently characterize as hedonistic and perverted. We also explore the relationship between Islam and other religions, the difficulty that Christians have had in accepting a divine disposition after Christ, and how Muslims have dealt with earlier divine revelations. These are all important topics that deserve to be treated at length and with accuracy and scholarly rigor. We strive in this volume to stop talking past one another and begin talking with one another. Getting Beyond Distortions, Ghosts of a Medieval Polemic In the last few years, there have been many images and depictions of Muhammad in the Western imagination, and many of them have been violent, grotesque, and unflattering. These images can be jarring. No founder of any other religious tradition is represented so consistently negatively. Not Confucius, not Lao Tzu, not Moses, not Buddha, and certainly not Christ. Some of the recent negative images of Muhammad are purely recycled images of hate from the bygone era of the Crusades and Christian polemics against Islam. What is particularly intriguing about these negative stereotypes is how unoriginal and unimaginative they are. Many medieval polemics present images of Muhammad as demonic, cursed, or satanic, or even as the Antichrist. Some classics of Western literature, such as Dante's Inferno, depict Muhammad as being cut up open right down through his torso and cast into the ninth circle of hell. The gruesome opening lines of the narrative read as follows, quote, No cask, even gape so wide for loss, of mile of, of, of mide or side stave as a soul I saw, cleft from the chin right down to where men fart. Between the legs and trials dangled, I saw the innards in a loathsome sack that, are, that turns what one has swallowed into shit. End quote. From the Inferno, Cantos 28, lines 22 through 27. A pious Muslim would so shudder at the mention of these words that she would have to add the phrase, a stuff for Allah, I seek forgiveness from God, for merely uttering them. Yet since we have to know what the history of our encounters with one another has been, we move on to the rest of Dante's encounter with Muhammad from the 20th, 20, 28th canto of Dante's Inferno, quote, While I was caught up in the sight of him, he looked at me with his hands ripped apart, his chest, saying, See how I rend myself, see how mangled is Muhammad. Ahead of me proceeds Ali in tears, his face split open from his chin to forelock, and all the others whom you see sowed scandal and schism while they lived, and that is why they are here, hacked asunder, a devil's posted there behind us." End quote. What is particularly intriguing is not just how mean-spirited and offensive these images are, but the fundamental misunderstandings of Islamic's teachings that they reflect. Where does the idea of Muhammad being split down the middle come from? 
It comes from a per uh, perversion of two Islamic tropes in a verse of the Quran. God speaking in the royal we comforts Muhammad by saying to him, quote, Did we not open for you your heart? And did we not remove from you your burden, the burden that weighed heavily on your back? And did we not raise you for you your remembrance? End quote. Quran, chapter 94, verses 1 through 3. The expression, opening one's heart, which is used repeatedly in the Quranic context, ties together the physical process of exhaling, specifically after the tension of holding one's breath, with the spiritual process of elation or, or of expansion, of being filled with air and life and spirit. In another verse of the Quran, chapter 20, verse 25, Moses prays to God to have his heart expanded. Interesting enough, the chapter in which this verse appeared is called Taha, traditionally one of the names of Prophet Muhammad. The verse quoted here about heart expansion is enacted, as it were, in the traditional biography of the Prophet's life through an episode of Muhammad's childhood. According to this narrative, an angel descends on Muhammad, reaches into his heart, and removes the source of all impurity by washing Muhammad's heart until it is pure. If we return to the image in Dante, we see now just how distorted and distorting his polemic against Muhammad actually is. A verse of the Quran that has to do with God comforting Muhammad and filling him with spirit, spiritual elation is a narrative about Muhammad's heart being purified or recast by the polemic Christian tradition as an image of Muhammad thrown into hellfire while being cut open from the throat to the area below the stomach. Dante turns a verse related to heart expansion and spiritual elevation into a symbol of eternal punishment. The very prophet who in Islamic teachings ascends to the zenith of paradise to have a face-to-face -to -face encounter with God and who chooses to return to humanity to give others the chance to have their own meeting with God is, is regulated by Dante to the bowels of hell. This is what I have referred to as the cognitive dissonance we are experiencing about Muhammad and exas exasperates the profound modern challenge to have sustained and engaged dialogue across faith lines. Dante is beyond a doubt one of the geniuses of Western literature, but if we are to have a meaningful religious dialogue today, across religious lines, we need to do better, much better, than, in, than the Italian sage. The Founding Fathers and the Current President's Positive Image of Islam Fortunately, the Western representation of Muhammad in particular and of Islam, more broadly, have never been uniform and uniformly bad. In particular, the Enlightened tradition even looked at Islam as a more rational religion and offered fairly positive evaluations of Muhammad. For example, during the age of Romanticism, Thomas Carlyle encountered the frequent medieval polemic against Muhammad for allegedly being a charlatan, quote, a false man found of religion? Why a false man cannot build a brick house, end quote. Carlyle also summarized the impact of Islam in the following positive terms, quote, to the Ar Arab nation it was a birth from darkness into light. Arabia first became alive by means of it. A poor shepherd people, roaming unnoticed in its desert since the creation of the world, a hero prophet was sent down to them with a word they could believe. See, the unnoticed becomes world notable. The small has grown world great. Within one century afterwards, Arabia is at Granada on this hand, at Delhi on that, glancing in valor and splendor in the light of genius. Arabia shines through long ages over a great section of the world. I said the great man was always as lightning out of heaven. The rest of man waited for him like fuel, and then they too would flame." End quote. Close to the American tradition, Benjamin Franklin famously stated that the standards of religious freedom in, Amer in America had to be so broad that, that when he had, was placed as a trustee of Westminster Hall, quote, even if the Mufti, Chief Justice of Constantinople from the Muslim Ottoman Empire, were to send a missionary to preach Mohammedanism to us, he would find a pulpit at his service. End quote. This openness to Islam was actually quite commonplace among America's founding fathers. When George Washington was asked in 1784 what kind of workers should be hired to work at Mount Vernon, he responded by stating that the best workers, regardless of their background, should be hired. Quote, if they are good workmen, they may be from Asia, Africa, or Europe. They may, they may be Mahometans, Jews, Christians, of any sect, or they may be atheists. End quote. Over the course of U.S. history, Muslim Americans have indeed fulfilled this promise of being hardworking and contributing citizens of this society that keeps the memory of George Washington alive. The lasting relationship between Muslims and America were further cemented through the U.S. Treaty with Tripoli in 1797, quote, The government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion, as it has in itself no character of enmity against the laws, religion, or tranquility of the Muslim men, Muslims, end quote. To which President John Adams added, quote, Now be it known that I, John Adams, President of the United States of America, have seen and considered that the said treaty do, by and with the advice and consent of the Senate, accept, ratify, and confirm the same in every clause and article thereof, end quote. 
In other words, the relationship between the United States and Muslims goes back to the very origins of the American experiment and was formed in part by the inclusive attitude of many of the founding fathers. If there is a figure even more quintessentially American than Benjamin Franklin or George Washington, it would have to be Thomas Jefferson. In 1765, Jefferson was studying for his bar exam to qualify as a lawyer. To equate himself with what various traditions had to offer about the law, he purchased the most recent and accurate translation of the Quran available, a work by George Sale called the Quran, commonly called the Al-Quran of Muhammad, which had been translated from the original in Arabic in 1734. Jefferson's personal copy of the Quran eventually became part of the holdings of the Library of Congress, and it recently gained a great deal of attention when it was used in the swearing-in ceremony of Keith Ellison, the first Muslim-American elected to the U.S. Congress. Many modern-day bigots and alarmists, viewing the choice of the Quran instead of the more common Bible is yet another slippery slope that would lead to the implosion of the American identity, called Ellison unpatriotic and a threat to American values. Ellison was making a deaf point through his use of the Quran as a scripture on which to be sworn into Congress. If Thomas Jefferson owned and studied the Quran, if he saw no contradiction between being American and being Muslim, why should we? Jefferson's interest in Islam and the Oriental wisdom, more broadly, was no passing fancy. He began a study of the Arabic language and grammar and obtained many books on the history of Islam and Muslim civilizations. He supported the establishment of academic programs for the study of the Orient. In his autobiography, he used language that indicated his desire to see this country become not merely a Christian country, but a house for all. He made this point em emphatically in his decision of a legal bill, quote, where the preamble declares that cohesion is a departure from the plan of the holy author of our religion, an amendment was proposed by inserting the words Jesus Christ, so that it should read a departure from the plan of Jesus Christ, the holy author of our religion. The assertion was rejected by a great majority in proof that they meant to comprehend within the mantle of its protection the Jew and the Gentile, the Christian, the Muhammad, the Hindu and the infidel of every denomination, end quote. Today we would, uh, would avoid phrases like the Al-Qur'an of Muhammad or Muhammadans instead of preferring to use the terms like the Qur'an or, and Muslims. Yet here is what is beyond doubt. On the eve of the founding of the American nation, leading, the forefather, leading forefathers like Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson felt compelled to study the Qur'an and the life of Muhammad, and they included Muslims as among those who were entitled to protection and freedom of religion in this country. We have a similar choice today. We can walk in their footsteps and create an open and dynamic society in which we celebrate the plurality of faith, or we can retreat back to the negative attitudes of Dante and the medieval polemists. These are both parts of the Western and more specifically American encounter with Islam, yet one choice leads us to mutual coexistence and the other to the further furthering of hostility and tension. Perhaps the most powerful declaration of support for Islam from an American president, le political leader was the June 2009 speech of President Obama in Cairo. In this historic speech, Barack Obama began by offering, quote, I have come here to seek a new beginning between the United States and Muslims around the world, one based upon mutual interest and mutual respect, and one based upon the truth that America and Islam are not e exclusive and need not be in competition. Instead, they overlap and share common principles, principles of justice and progress, tolerance, and the dignity of all human beings, end quote. He, sent, he went on to quote from the Quran, quote, being conscious of God and speak always the truth, end quote, and offered that he too promised to follow the spiritual and moral guidance of this verse and speak truthfully. He recalled many historical markers between Islam and the United States, including Morocco, a Muslim nation, having been the first to recognize the United States of America, John Adams' comments on the Treaty of Tripoli, and the election of the Muslim American Keith Ellison to Congress. In quite, in, quite, in quite possibly the most emphatic statement of support of any American president has ever made on behalf of Islam, he stated, quote, And I consider it part of my responsibility as President of the United States to fight against negative stereotypes of Islam wherever they appear, end quote. Recognizing the appeal to Muslims of the life of the Prophet, Obama definitely included a reference to the most powerful spiritual narrative in the life of the Prophet, that of the heavenly ascension, which we study in depth in this volume. In speaking of his vision for Jerusalem as a place where Muslims, Jews, and Christians could worship freely side by side, Obama referred to Jerusalem through the analogy of Muhammad's heavenly ascension, quote, a place for all the children of Abraham to mingle peacefully together, as in the story of the Isra, where Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, peace be upon them, joined in prayer, end quote. The power of this kind of re reference was not lost on Muslim audiences. Never before had an American president showed such a profound understanding of the symbolism of Prophet Muhammad's ascension or used in such a potent way to paint a picture of the coming together of humanity. These were just words, but words that promoted a sense of peace, pluralism, and respectful coexistence. 
and we will continue in part two.